Good evening, everybody. I am Narayanan Kurur, uh, Dean Academics at IIT Delhi. And uh, the Institute Lecture Series is uh, one of the flagship events of the uh, Office of uh, Dean Academics, the outreach uh, Good evening, everybody. Part of the um, academic section. I am Narayanan Kuru. And today um, we are Dean very pleased to academics have with us at uh, IIT Delhi. Mr. Akhim and uh, uh, the Steiner Institute Lecture Series is of the uh, one Nations of the flagship events program. of the uh, uh, so office. Um, of we are already uh, a little running a little bit late. So uh, Good evening, everybody. Part of the uh, uh, I am Narayanan Kuru. And today we are very pleased to have with us at IIT Delhi, Mr. Akim and uh, uh, the Steiner Institute Lecture Series is of the uh, one Nations of the flagship events program. of the uh, uh, so office. Um, so of we are already uh, a little academics, running a little bit late. Today is uh, uh, good evening, uh, uh, part of the uh, uh, I am Narayanan Guru, and, and today we are the very pleased academics to have with us at uh, IIT Delhi. C. V. Raman, Akhim and uh, the China Institute Lecture Series is of the one of the flagship events of the so office of we are already uh, a little running a little bit late. Uh, 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 good evening, uh, uh, part of the uh, 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 I am Narayanan Guru, and today is Global Science for Global yeah, so we look forward office. to okay. hearing you. This is like a special lecture. It is uh, co-organized by the United Nations. I am not a developer and today you and Google Science and, and, and we thank them for this. Uh, we are running uh, for uh, a little bit of an introduction to Mr. Akin Steiner. One of the flagship Akin Steiner is the UNDP administrator for this. Okay. This is a special lecture. It is co-organized by the Nations General Assembly. I am not a developer and today. Uh, uh, following uh, his and his nomination by the Secretary uh, General, uh, we are running uh, and a little bit of an introduction. He's on his second Mr. term. Uh, uh, each term, uh, one of the flagship uh, China, the UNDP administrator uh, for um, okay. this June is a uh, special uh, vice union uh, organized by the Nations General Assembly. I am confirmed which is the party general. He's on and his nomination by the Secretary General. We are running and a little bit of an introduction. He's on his second term. Each term, one of the flagship. This time I'm at the UNDP administrator for June is a special vice union of the United States General Assembly. I am the by the Secretary General. And for a little bit of an introduction, he's on his second term. Each term of the election is the UNDP administrator for June is a special vice union of the United States General Assembly. I am confirmed which is the party general and the nomination by the Secretary General Assembly. And for a little bit of an introduction, he's on his second term. Each director of the election is the UNDP administrator for government. June is a special vice president of the United States General Assembly. I am also the Secretary General and the nomination by the Secretary General Assembly. And for a little bit of an introduction, he's on his second term. Each director of the action is the UNDP administrator for the government. June is a special vice president of the United States. I am also the director of the nomination by the Secretary General. And a little bit of an introduction on his second list of each director of the action is the UNDP administrator for the government. June is a special vice president of the United States. I have 
consequences of their decisions. One of the great things in human history is that we are on a continuous journey of knowledge and discovery, and it is cumulative knowledge. And suddenly, with the advent of digital technology, of AI, and all that still lies ahead, instant access to an almost endless universe of information is also at our disposal. So when you think about the future of science, technology, innovation, I think one of the things that I would like to do with you this afternoon is to reflect for a moment on what it means to be amongst the elite, because that is not to just um, stroke your egos, but to also recognize that in leaving an institution and completing your academic training at the top of that pinnacle of academic research and excellence is also an extraordinary privilege. Some of the greatest scientists, some of the greatest innovators have been people who turned something that they were given not only into something that can become the next great commercial proposition, the next software, the next you know, Apple or Infosys or whatever it may be, but that began to ask themselves, what is it that I can do with what I've learned to address issues that clearly are all around me? Now, at a certain point, it may have been poverty, it may have been health, disease, access to clean water. But in today's world, things have gotten more complex because the questions that, in part, the world will rely upon you as students, as graduates, as researchers, as innovators, perhaps tomorrow's technology gurus, are questions such as how on earth are we going to decarbonize in the next 25 years a global economy 
that for 200 years has become inextricably linked to the use of fossil fuels as a way of growing, thriving, powering industry, urbanization, human welfare, economic growth. Or how on earth are we going to feed eight, nine, 10 billion people on this planet when already our agricultural production systems today are essentially causing us to lose an amount of fertile land that we desperately need to rely on in order to grow food in the future, or indeed water scarcity. I just left Paris and looked out of the window of the aircraft while I was reading an article about the fact that there has been hardly any rainfall in France, that rivers in February are beginning to run dry. That may mean that power stations, you know, France relies a lot on nuclear energy, may have to be brought down because some of the cooling that is relied on on these rivers is actually something that is now perilously close to perhaps not being available in a few months' time. This is not science fiction. It happened already some years back. More importantly, um, what about the population of France that needs regular water supplies? Anybody who has grown up in India knows that water is life and you know the absence of water or the non-availability of clean drinking water is an immediate threat to life. Europe has almost forgotten what it is like to worry about water because water comes out of a tap. But the harsh truth is water doesn't come out of a tap. Water comes out of an ecosystem, out of an ecological infrastructure that is either maintained or destroyed, that is compromised or enhanced. And so when we talk about how on earth are we going to feed 8 billion people, then one of the interesting questions we have to ask ourselves is, where on earth are we going to find the water and the soils and the kind of agricultural technology that will allow us to succeed in that objective? Most of you will be familiar that well over 70% of water consumption around the world is for agriculture. In Australia, there is a river basin called the Murray-Darling Basin, where already 15, 20 years ago, farmers essentially began trading their water rights with downstream urban centers because they would pay them more to buy their water rights in order to supply the city with water than they could earn by growing food on that land. Now, some people thought this is an ingenious example of how market mechanisms work, demand and supply. But at some point, somebody asked, okay, if we are going to use a lot of our water to sustain the urban cities, where in Australia are we going to grow food in the future? Because we also have to feed Australia. I give you just a few of these examples because with our collective consumption production footprint on the planet today, we are reaching points of transition and transformation that are needed in which science, technology, and innovation become systemically relevant for what happens next. And, you know, one could go back to also some of the brilliant minds that have shaped India's discourse about development and frame it from different points of view. You could go back to uh, Mahatma Gandhi, who, you know, very often looked at the consumption patterns of those who were well off as essentially already signaling an age of irresponsibility. You could pivot forward to an Professor Amartya Sen, who began to look at you know, the way we measure development and human progress through his work on development economics and later the very strong influence that he had on UNDP's work when we developed the Human Development Index, the Human Development Reports of UNDP, now 32 years old, which at the time were a direct challenge to an oversimplified view of how you actually measure progress in development, namely by measuring growth in income and in GDP. And yet, as you all, I'm sure, are aware, that is not an adequate form of measuring development progress. And we have been struggling ever since to move beyond GDP, not to abandon it, but how to complete a better understanding of what it is to talk about development as success. So in um, speaking to you today, let me take you to two or three journeys, perhaps where I believe what we often associate with science, technology, and innovation, and how they relate to some of the great sustainable development challenges of our time as embodied in these 17 sustainable development goals. 
that perhaps I can trigger a little bit of your imagination and interest to think of yourselves as truly central to what happens next, or to put it differently, to the future of development. Now, I asked a few of your faculty, if I speak about the SDGs, are you going to look fascinated, excited, uh, or maybe um, a little bit wondering why should we worry about the SDGs? The simplest way I can explain to you why you should be extremely focused about the SDGs is that first of all, they are an extraordinarily simple and smart way of talking about one of the great challenges that you will also have to rise to, which is that in solving problems in our age, it's not about silver bullets anymore. It's not about single answers. It's about dealing with complexity and in a sense managing complexity in the way that you design solutions. And the SDGs are an attempt to take what I would often describe as the great risks of our time and then turning them into goals which allow us to think of a template in which designing development solutions cannot only be about providing electricity, SDG 7, access to electricity. You have to design SDG 7 with SDG 13 in mind, which is climate change and therefore decarbonization. But you can't ignore the fact that in doing so, you will have to also bring in SDG 1, which is about eradication of poverty. And so the story goes on. So I hope for those of you who have looked at the SDGs as something that was once adopted you know, in the General Assembly Hall many years ago, let me tell you that in part what you will do with those SDGs will decide whether we will lose them in the next two or three years as a um, declaration of interdependence. And I quote here former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon on the day that these were adopted by the member states of the UN, who by the way developed these SDGs. So they're not some theoretical body of work that was developed in a very clever department of the United Nations, but they were negotiated over two years by the world's member states to say, here for the first time is Agenda 2030 that applies to every country on Earth. Because remember, development very often was a narrative about how the wealthier part of the world would help the poorer part of the world would catch up and then we would all live in happiness ever after. Now here we are in the year 2023, happiness ever after hasn't arrived and development today is as much about the decisions of those who consume in one part of the world as it is about those who produce in another part of the world, what kind of energy footprint they have, what kind of ecological footprint they have. And therefore, I hope I can either further uh, increase your interest in the SDGs or resuscitate your interest in them because if you want to understand how on earth we are going to move forward as a global family of human beings in the next 20, 30 years, and the decisions therefore we take between now and 2030 matter enormously, then the SDGs are not the answer, but they are a very valuable tool. And they also are, as Ban Ki-moon said, a declaration of interdependence. So let's take for a moment this question, how on earth are we going to decarbonize our global economy in essentially less than 25 years. Because to some, this is purely a question of technology. To others, it's purely a question of economics. And to others, again, it's purely a question of politics and political economy. As engineers, you don't have the privilege anymore to design solutions that take place outside those enabling conditions. Just now, the world is negotiating something called just energy transition partnerships. The richer world really beginning to panic that in the larger developing economies, you know, the carbon footprint is not going to decline fast enough. So a just energy partnership is developed that is supposed to accelerate the ability of these developing country economies to transition faster out of coal initially. But as you very quickly discover, it's not the technology that's the problem. It's not even the economics of the alternative electricity generating technologies, that's the problem. It is the societies that have grown up around a particular form of energy generation and supply and the economics of that because our economies have become very comfortable with an energy economy that is very often a monopoly, a state monopoly or an oligopoly where industries and venture capital and investors have gotten used to the fact that these are big centralized generating 
uh, infrastructure projects that have to be run by big corporations. And suddenly people come along and say, no, you can just put up some solar panels. No, you can put up a wind turbine. You can tap geothermal energy. And the entire energy economy goes into deep disruption mode. Why is that happening? Well, because business model matter. And why have Shell and BP and others tried two or three times now over the last 20 years to become beyond petroleum? Remember that slogan that you may still have heard? When BP thought it would be the energy company of the future and found itself 10 years later being really an oil and gas company again. These are the complexities in which we need to think about how science, technology, and innovation begin to align different ways of designing for solutions. Yes, we can wait for the next generation of photovoltaic uh, panels of technologies um, where the efficiency of a panel will be maybe 40 or 50% instead of where we originally started at 7%, then 15, maybe 20% in actually producing electricity, converting energy into electricity. But it's going to take more than that, because if we want to accelerate these transitions, then we have to do what India right now is doing in one of the most remarkable experiments, which is to get 480,000 megawatts of renewable electricity generating infrastructure working in India's energy economy by 2030. That is one of the boldest and most ambitious investment pathways to add clean energy to a national energy matrix. But let me tell you, India started late. Um, China is today a leading economy in terms of renewable energy. It's not something that the rest of the world necessarily applauds sometimes and actually has many sleepless nights over. An economy like Germany that originally was at the forefront of manufacturing photovoltaic technology, wind power, saw essentially its leadership in that market um, migrate to China. But in so doing, we should not underestimate what China did for Africa because by bringing the price per kilowatt hour of renewable energy technology down significantly and faster, it actually opened up for the African continent an economic rationale for why renewable energy infrastructure would be a shortcut to connecting the 600 million citizens on the African continent that still don't have access to electricity today. Let me put a semicolon here because Essentially, what I'm saying to you is here is a challenge that is in the core of where many of you, I hope, will put some of your energy, namely the decarbonization of our economies, which can then extend into mobility, into infrastructure, buildings, agriculture. These are the frontiers of a science, technology, and innovation agenda that take you to the core of our societies and economies today. A second one in which, as Indian citizens, you will not be surprised, and that obviously is featuring very much also in the context of India's G20 presidency this year, is the whole universe of digital, of data, of AI, of the great you know, stack that India has uh, produced and the fascination that the rest of the world has now developed for perhaps one of the boldest experiments in human history of how to, in almost no time, bring the benefits of technology, the frontier of data processing, to the core of some developmental objectives. In this instance, um, the digital ID, but also the payment platforms. Now, if I were to tell you today that a few years ago, many people would have dismissed this as you know, the luxury of a technology-fascinated um, society or generation, but in UNDP, we have studied this from many different angles and many different perspectives. We look at, for example, the advent of digital finance as the single most revolutionary transformation of women's access to the financial system in human history. Because until about eight to 10 years ago, the vast majority of women were unable to walk through the front doors of a financial system that basically relied on banks. They had often no IDs, they certainly didn't have a credit record, often they don't have an address that is legally recognized, and they certainly were not considered to be a clientele that a bank was trying to bring through its front doors. Arrives digital technology, the ability to operate of a smartphone, and then the kind of extraordinary developments that you have been witnessing in India, or as I lived in Kenya for 10 years, and I saw M-Pesa transform the reality literally for 
millions of women. And if you go onto the global level today, it is fair to say that there are hundreds of millions of women who for the first time in their lives have actually become actors in the financial economy. That for the longest of time, they were simply locked out from. So if you care about inequality, about gender issues, and you do not connect to the possibilities of technology and the kind of innovations that are now driving the frontiers of financial inclusion, you are missing probably the most important benefit that it has actually brought. This is empowerment. This is addressing inequality. This is addressing exclusion. And therefore, in thinking about what happens next with the stack, what happens next with digital public infrastructure, or indeed digital public goods, should be at the forefront of anyone working in the field of science, technology, innovation today. Because you will, by either not thinking about it, or by thinking about it, determine perhaps the ability of millions of people to be part of that new economy you are helping to shape, or to exclude them. And this is not a hypothetical challenge, because in our world of development, we have endless stories of exclusion, of leaving people behind, of not focusing on those who don't have the money to be able to buy themselves an internet connection when it is still expensive, or a smartphone. It is essentially being left behind. And I believe that the digital frontier of development uh, change and the way that digital will transform development in the years to come is so fast that if you do not focus on inclusion, on how to build digital ecosystems that allow and design for helping those who do not have the money to buy the bus ticket to get on that bus initially, we will lock hundreds of millions out of this economy and inequality will become even more pervasive. So another example of where science, technology, and innovation meets the reality of the society in which we operate. And let me give you a last example. Perhaps one that to some of you in this room will seem a little bit exotic when I present it to you, but I'm deeply convinced that in the way that we look at nature today is actually something that needs to be fundamentally different from even a generation or two after um, C.V. Raman got his Nobel Physics Prize. My own father was a plant breeder, plant geneticist. He grew up in that age when essentially the, the realm of possibility was really defined by overcoming nature, by moving beyond nature and thinking about the future. You know, it was the age of putting people on a rocket and sending them to the moon. That view that we would become independent of nature drove much of the 20th century view of progress, of innovation, of technology. And then something extraordinary happened, which is that we find ourselves at the beginning of the 21st century, suddenly reminded that in our collective footprint, we have begun to compromise our life support systems on the planet to such an extent that climate change, loss of biodiversity, pollution, have become such profound problems that they actually threaten the very future of human civilization on this planet. Who would have thought that if you had raised that even in the 1970s or 80s? when pollution was, in a sense, the first frontier on which people began to ask themselves, is this really development when we have to live in such polluted cities? You know that on average, every year at the moment, according to the WHO, seven to eight million people worldwide die prematurely because of indoor and outdoor pollution. Just reflect for a moment on this figure. <clears throat> seven to eight million people, which in some economists' view is, well, the price of development, you know, or the cost you pay for poverty. No, it's not. It's the decision to value the life of some much lower than the life of others. You know, in the UK of the Industrial Revolution, human geography was a very interesting illustration of what happened, because those who had money lived upstream of the factories and certainly not downwind of where pollution was taking place. Human geography uh, gave us great insights into how people decide how much they value clean air and nature. I often say, if you go to New York City today and you look for where the most expensive real estate is, <clears throat> oddly enough, it's in the place where people live who usually say that nature doesn't matter. I, you know, 100 meters from Central Park, where they can walk in the greenest spot in New York City and Manhattan. So how we value nature is, however, not just a matter of 
economics. It's actually understanding the ecological infrastructure that sustains our economies. And I use that term very deliberately because we often think that nature is about maybe a bird species, a butterfly, or a particular plant, because it took us the better part of thousands of years of human evolution, science, and knowledge to understand that actually ecosystems are highly complex systems that enable life to thrive or indeed to die. So let me take this a little bit closer to where if you are now graduating in science, computer science, engineering, in your career, what does this mean? It means beginning to think about how you design a product or a process or a new material, science innovation, by perhaps first of all focusing on the ingenuity of nature. How is it that an abalone shell that you find at the bottom of the ocean that grows in ambient temperatures there develops the same material strength as something that we basically need to heat up in a furnace to 800 degrees centigrade or more in order to produce iron or steel. And yet the abalone shell does it right there at the bottom of the sea. And this is where some of the most interesting new frontiers of science being able to uncover the ingenuity of nature will um, in the future drive the frontiers of research. Material science, industrial processes, the ability to understand how you can convert the energy that the sun you know, brings every day to planet Earth is so much more than we could ever need to produce the electricity for a world of 16 billion people. How do we harness these elements of nature that would allow us with eight or nine billion people to actually live on this planet and design the kinds of products, industries, industrial processes, materials that would delink human consumption and the satisfaction of human needs from the extraordinary destructive path that again human ingenuity allowed us to embark on in the last two to three hundred years when industrialization, modern science, really did give us a way to develop entirely new possibilities. So if I end um, with perhaps inviting you on a journey of imagining yourself as being somebody who is an engineer from IIT, who may be in the class of 2023, who may leave tomorrow and have the option of you know, becoming the next um, Steve Jobs or whoever you want to cite in terms of the aspiration that no doubt all of us in some way have. We would all love to start in a garage, that's the romantic end, except when you actually have to do it in a garage, it's not so much fun, but afterwards it is always a wonderful story to tell. And the next thing is you've created a platform on which the world can communicate with each other, can transact with each other. But you know, most of them, and this is I think no coincidence, by the time they have achieved the pinnacle of their ingenuity translating into commercial success or just having created something extraordinary, they suddenly become philanthropists. Why? Because, you know, the end of the journey is not to become ever richer. Yes, some people will watch their you know, bank accounts grow forever. But those who you know, have a billion or two or five or ten and some even have you know, 200, 300 billions on their bank account now, frankly, uh, the utility of another billion is fairly marginal, as economists would call it. But to perhaps, and you know, let's give Elon Musk credit, to drive electric mobility at a moment in time when everybody else said this is ridiculous, we're going to rely on you know, fossil fuel-based mobility for the next 30 to 40 years, maybe something else will come along. He pioneered with a single-mindedness a Tesla project that ultimately advanced, I would argue, by at least 10 to 20 years, the spread of electronic vehicle mobility in the world. And today he actually has to make sure that he doesn't get overtaken by others. But this is the ingenuity, and he actually even offered some of the intellectual property that was fundamental to the Tesla technology for free because he knew that that way he would expand markets quicker and ultimately create more demand. So think of yourselves at this point in your life, I hope, and on National Science Day as more than just the individual genius who may you know, hit 
that fantastic point suddenly where you discover, develop something, but perhaps carry the SDGs in your back pocket. Um, remember the stories of people who you admire, whether it's C.V. Raman today, whether it is Mahatma Gandhi, Amartya Sen, Nelson Mandela, or Alf Albert Einstein, for that matter. People who ultimately turn their own ingenuity into essentially an asset for our societies to answer the great questions of their time. And it is in that spirit that in leading the UN development program today and being part of a community of people who are focused on the great questions of our time, on how are we going to feed ourselves, how are we going to decarbonize, how are we going to make sure that technology does not exclude hundreds of millions of people because they may be too poor, they lack the education or the infrastructure to participate in that future that is already there for others. Those are questions that you, I hope, will carry within your intellectual and also personal uh, commitment to wherever you may find yourselves working. And frankly, it has nothing to do whether you work for a company or for the civil service or for the United Nations or for an NGO. It's what you carry in your hearts, in your minds, and ultimately by keeping your eye also on those around you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steiner. Uh, the next session, which is question and answer session, will be moderated by my colleague, Professor Dhenya. Dhenya. Hello. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Steiner, for that uh, insightful and engaging talk. I always thought that the most difficult part, uh, task, is for the speaker in, or in, at such events, but I do realize that mine is going to be the most difficult part, <laughs> given what to choose and how to choose in a houseful audience like this. So uh, while just brushing through this one, I would like to start with a most basic question. It would, it would appear simple, but I'm not sure whether it is difficult to answer or not. So there are, if we take the two words in SDG, uh, sustainability and development. So often these words, the way we perceive or way we implement, uh, at least for some countries, are contradictory to each other. So should we redefine the word growth or development or when we couple these two together? What's your take on that? Well, the simplest answer is that growth has shown itself to both be very useful but also increasingly limiting because growth describes essentially a throughput um, in an economy. You know, one of the tasks that I am dealing with right now is assisting uh, the United Nations with UNDP to um, deal with an oil tanker that is you know, moored off the coast of Yemen, where, as you know, there is a conflict. That tanker is in the middle of the conflict zone. It is full of oil. It has been abandoned for seven to 10 years and is in danger of breaking apart. That tanker, when it breaks apart, could cause an oil pollution incident with a cost estimate of around 20 billion US dollars. Now, the odd thing in economics is that that $20 billion would actually significantly increase the GDP of Yemen because the cleanup operation, everything we would expend around it, would actually count as something positive. Now, it's a bit of an egregious example, but actually, in honesty, this is what we have been measuring for the last 100 years. And this is why the Secretary General has argued that we must move beyond GDP, not to throw it out because it clearly captures a part of it. But growth alone does not define development progress or human well-being. And, you know, a per capita GDP, which is often the notion that is used to justify why certain policies are needed to grow an economy, can also be very distorting. A country that may have a particular mineral and earns a lot of money or an oil and gas source 
may end up in economic statistics with an extraordinary per capita income, but could still have a population where 90% of its citizens live below the poverty line. There is even a country in West Africa, one of the largest economies on the African continent, where 60% of its population do not have access to electricity today after 50 years of a globally significant oil and gas industry operating in that country. So how do we actually, first of all, deal with growth as being too narrow a way to look at this? And to say that sustainability and development may be you know, contradictory uh, concepts, I think is more an expression of the limitation of human imagination and a lack of intellectual honesty than a fact of life. And I'll just give you another illustration. Renewable energy technologies have been in the drawers of energy companies and engineers and um, electrical engineering companies for the better part of the last century. The fact that they did not become part of the energy economy had more to do with the fact that in using fossil fuels, for the better part of the 20th century, we essentially factored out all the costs associated with fossil fuels the pollution, the health costs, lead in petrol, and so artificially kept technologies that were cleaner, economically competitive in the drawers. For Africa today, the argument that going to and pivoting to a renewable energy infrastructure um, is no longer an argument that it is more costly. It's in fact, to many, the shortcut to progress. This is why UNDP is so heavily committed to helping Africa put the regulatory frameworks in place to create the financing environment in which, which is Africa's greatest challenge, mm -hmm. to massively expand access to electricity. And we have now a project on off-grid um, renewable energy technology that will cover 21 countries simultaneously, that in five years' time, if you know, we are able to succeed, could connect 265 million people to modern electricity supplies which will transform their economy, their livelihood. We know that. So, no, I would strongly argue against putting growth as, you know, the single criterion. Mm -hmm. And secondly, development is not equals growth. And sustainable development is actually the smarter way of thinking about long-term development, particularly for those who will pay the price of mm -hmm. the consumption or production of others. Yeah, so, but uh, when we define these SDGs, our focus is, uh, is on us. And we normally uh, vomit uh, the, the stakeholder, the environment as a stakeholder. But off late, there are discussion to consider the environment also as a stakeholder, the health of a river or, or anything like that. So in that case, uh, the way we have defined SDGs or there are so many goals and there are so many tasks in each of these goals, in some of those environment is, is do included, is included, but is it enough? or should we have to redefine the task, given the way that we have perceived the growth or the development? I'm combining the first question with the second one. Well, if I understand you correctly, I would argue that um, the SDGs are ultimately not um, an expression of either the way we confer about the environment, whether it is a plant species or an animal species, um, a legal right or an identity. I think that is a decision that you know belongs in the realm of people, of communities. I don't think we should legislate for that. And so the SDGs are not essentially conferring rights on one against the other. They are essentially creating the principle of equity and sustainability. And so the SDGs are centered on the decisions that we as humans will make that affect others. First of all, other human beings, other communities, nations. And secondly, that affect the environment, and through affecting the environment will again mm -hmm. affect the future yeah. of development. Because development, frankly, is a very human-centric and anthropocentric concept, right? I mean, the whole planet could exist perfectly well without us. We couldn't exist yeah. without the rest of the planet. So take the SDGs as humanity's sort of um, 21st century way of coming to terms with the fact that we could be totally redundant, but actually in the way that we behave, we could make ourselves redundant. And that's why it is more centered on that kind of rational way of managing ourselves mm. than on fundamental questions that go deep into the ethics, for example, yeah. of you know the right of an animal to live or um, conferring a legal identity on a river basin, for that yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah. 
So in your talk also you have mentioned that there are 17 SDGs to be exact. One question uh, by Pankaj is that these SDGs are so comprehensive and exhaustive that we sometimes feel overwhelmed by the sheer number and the scale of challenges and the overlap between uh, these SDGs. Uh, then wonder we how we can even, whether we can even solve them. So what, what would be your, your advice on that? Well, there is a way of answering this that is to say, look, life in the 21st century is complicated. I mean, you know, uh, 250 years ago, we were just one billion people on this planet. Yeah. And, you know, when we ran out of something, we kind of moved on to somewhere else. Or, you know, with colonialism and industrialization, we started taking other people's resources and turning them into an economic asset. Here we are, I mean, we are now at the point of being eight billion people on this planet, and not only are we more people, we also consume an extraordinary amount, and exponentially so. Yeah, we call that adaptation. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, or evolution, right? Yeah. Some would put it even more positively. But my point is, look, you could have 10 SDGs, you could have 17, we could have had 150 up there. We need to design for complexity. And we also need to be careful that we don't define smarter answers simply in terms of trade-offs. Something I learned when I led the World Commission on Dams, because you know when some of you may even end up in the business of building dams and the hydropower uh, infrastructure, for the better part of the last 100 years, very often the way that we solve the dilemma of, for instance, building a dam and maybe you know, significantly affecting the ecological balance of a river downstream or even affecting the economy of tens of thousands of people downstream because rivers no longer flow the way they did, or even worse, resettling people. And it was essentially tra framed as a trade-off. No, no, but you know, we, we need modernization and you know, the cities need power or we need to produce food and that's simply the price of development. We'll, we'll give them a new village, we'll resettle them. And you know, we have many rivers. I mean, you know, we have so much to gain from that. Yeah. This trade-off mentality has led to so many injustices that the blindness of sometimes designing a dam, which is by itself neither good or bad, but designing it in the ignorance of what it means to move a community and resettle it, and 30 years later, the power lines are still going across that resettlement area that very often was designed really badly, and the very people that you remove to build a hydropower dam haven't actually got access to electricity. This is not a rare story. Um, and again, it, it demonstrates that we need to design for far more complex answers and solutions. And frankly speaking, we are in the 21st century. We're now talking about you know, artificial intelligence, quantum computing. I mean, the ability to process data information is you know, a quantum leap to where we were even mm -hmm. 10 years ago. So we should not be scared of finding smarter answers to difficult problems. Mm -hmm. And I think out of that will come better development answers. Yeah. Since you touched upon technology, I have a question on te technology versus sustainability. Uh, while technology is playing an important role in coming up with new solutions to tackle climate change, uh, its increased adoption at both industrial as well as individual levels is also increasing the demand for energy that are contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. For example, uh, large data centers uh, or increased manufacturing of electronic devices like mobile phone and lap laptop. So how do we address this dichotomy? Sometimes it's a temporary problem. Sometimes mm -hmm. it is a question of designing more efficient technologies. Certainly right now, <coughs> we have already learned that you know, cryptocurrencies have created an extraordinary increase in, in electricity consumption that is needed by our data centers. Quantum computing uh, will probably you know, bring in another dimension. So it puts even more of a premium on finding a way in which we can power our economies decoupled from the impact that traditionally power production would have on the planet. Now, as you probably have known and learned, the amount of energy we can harness on our planet through renewables is de facto endless. So the debate is another interesting example right now in the context of green hydrogen. A country like Namibia can essentially afford to produce green hydrogen and export it because it can build a renewable energy infrastructure that 
makes access to electricity essentially a zero marginal cost phenomenon beyond the capital expenditure that is needed to install it. Mm. So maybe we will live by 2050 in a world where you know production of electricity, frankly, is the least of our problems because we will have actually switched onto a renewable energy platform all over the world. Other forms of storage will have allowed us to overcome some of the practical limitations of using variable renewable power right now, green hydrogen, battery technology, I mean, you name it, there are so many frontiers of research. So I would say we have a short-term problem, which is, you know, spikes in power consumption in new technologies, but even more of a reason to accelerate the transition towards a renewable energy platform, where essentially the amount of electricity we consume is of very little consequence to either the planet in a negative sense, yeah. and certainly no longer a restriction on what we can do with the power of technology. Yeah, at the proportion stage itself, there should be a holistic way regarding to, from the perception of sustainability Precisely. as well, yeah. yeah. So there are a couple of questions, interesting questions on net zero emissions. Uh, how net zero emission targets set by different countries is going to impact SDG goals? Uh, and along with that, what role is digital infrastructure playing in achieving net zero goal? You know, this September, the world will meet in New York for an SDG summit. It's yeah. halfway to 2030. And, you know, as many of you can imagine, on the back of a pandemic and now all the economic disruption that is coming out of the war with Ukraine on energy markets, food markets, on capital markets, I don't think it'll take a lot of imagination to realize that the targets and indicators we set for 2030 under each of these goals will not be a great story of success. And yet what I would argue is that if you take, for example, <coughs> renewable energy technology and decarbonization, ironically, the pandemic and now the war in Ukraine will accelerate the transition towards greener technologies, greening of economies, and in fact will accelerate it so far that we may in fact be exceeding the targets that we had set for ourselves. Mm. And it is because finally the rationale of energy security, of energy autonomy, um, become far more recognized as drivers for national decision making. And suddenly the argument that, well, we've invested in coal-fired power infrastructure, you know, these are investments of 30 years, uh, we cannot afford to disrupt this economy so quickly, give way to, no, we need energy independence, we need energy security, mm. and suddenly you see, you know, a energy revolution. And I don't know how many of you have seen the statistics. In 2022, 90% of all electricity generating infrastructure brought into the energy systems of the world were actually renewable. So the energy revolution is already in full swing, but it obviously began from a very flat curve and is now getting into a very steep curve. And that's why I think we will see, perhaps in some of the goals, ironically, the crisis accelerating progress. In others, it is throwing us back. Poverty is increasing. The number of displaced people and refugees from natural disasters is growing exponentially. We have 100 million people last year who have basically had to flee the place they call home, either into another country, becoming refugees, or internally displaced people. The highest number in the last 75 years. So it's going to go in both directions. On digital and at accelerating this energy transition, I think you already see in India, you see in many other parts of the world um, that it's going to be integral to the ability to move faster, whether it is the ability to use data to better predict um, you know, energy demand, to manage uh, you know, fluctuations in electricity consumption, whether it's entirely new business models where you know, in Kenya already five, six years ago, a platform was developed called Encopa, which essentially allows the investors to buy 10,000 photovoltaic panels, install them in villages, and through smartphones, you have a pay-as-you-go electricity supply. In India, similar schemes are already underway. So it certainly overcomes a problem of poverty mm -hmm. in terms of accessing renewable energy infrastructure. And it also addresses the fact that poor people do actually pay extraordinary amounts of money in relation to their income for energy, whether it's kerosene, the time they have to invest in collecting firewood and biomass. So digital suddenly allows 
those with money who normally would not be interested in you know, installing one panel after another in the village, to meet those who cannot afford to buy the panel themselves initially, but can pay for that incremental amount of electricity they consume. And you know, Terry and others have been very much at the forefront of yeah, experimenting yeah. with that. So this is another illustration of how digital actually can sure. be transformative. Sure. So I have uh, you know, more and more questions being flooded, so I would like to give the platform to a couple of audience. Uh, there is a lengthy question by Professor Suma Atre, and if you can uh, ask that by yourself, I'll be grateful. <laughs> it's really lengthy. So my question is um, something that I've thought about for a while and not known the answer, so I thought I should, should ask you. Um, I really like the fact that the SDGs are a rallying cry. I mean, this is the first time the world has said that these are big problems and we need to put all our effort to solve it. Uh, but the reality is that many of the solutions are actually in developed countries rather than in developing countries. So in a previous um, sort of um, um, a previous decade of thinking on development, the, the idea was that you know, countries would create the capacity to produce what they wanted for themselves. This was the whole mission of technology. But I just wonder with this emphasis on social development goals, and with the inability of most developing countries to actually produce for themselves the te technologies they need to solve it, have we just relegated the whole of the developing world to being passive consumers? And it worries me a lot because you know if you don't have a strong government like was there in China, which sort of realized that energy security was very important and invested in it, you're actually leaving some of these poor countries more rather than less vulnerable in the name of interdependence. So I'm not sure what's the answer to it, and I'm not sure that I got the wrong end of the stick, perhaps. But I thought, you know, since you've been involved in framing these goals, you might be able to shed some light. Thank you. No, it's a very valid question, and I think there is probably not a singular answer to that. Um, you know, who is the developing world today? I mean, do we still count China, um, which in the UN is, you know, G77 plus China uh, amongst the developing world? Well, in all the indices, they are still a developing economy per capita income-wise, not without justification. I mean, we, this is where we come back to what does per capita income tell us really about where a nation's state of development is. Um, where does India position itself? Yes, in terms of um, per capita income, uh, GDP, um, it very much sees itself as a developing nation, but you know, as I just learned, Norway and Finland have developed their new uh, payment systems with essentially Indian engineering, <laughs> Indian software solutions. So, um, but let's go to another country. Let's go to Kenya, where I lived. And again, you know, Kenya, I think, is another illustration that in our world of today, there are still very harsh realities, and UNDP very often focuses on that, where inequality and access to resources can be a fundamental blockage, but it's increasingly actually in the domain of finance and financing rather than technology, if I may be so bold to put a very generalized statement out there. Um, you know, Kenya is today producing 95, 92% of its electricity with renewables. It disregarded the advice from the premier development institutions of the international aid community to not go for geothermal power and wind power, of which it has plenty. Because it was told, no, it's too expensive and you haven't got the, the power grid in, in, in connecting, for example, the remote area where what the largest wind power farm on the African continent has now been built by Kenya. You can go to a country like Uruguay, where the Minister of Finance today is essentially come to the conclusion that when they analyze the subsidies they use for fossil fuels to subsidize public transport, that it's more expensive to subsidize diesel fuel than to subsidize the switch over to electric buses, which actually would be cheaper to subsidize in terms of the fare that a consumer has to pay. This is also the country that has gone to the capital markets, and here I come to the financing issue, and launched last 
in November, and sustainability-linked performance bond. Essentially, borrowing money as Uruguay, but by linking its forest cover management and its CO2 reduction to its interest rate that it would pay. So it said, if we overperform and reduce our CO2 emissions more than we have committed to, you who are lending us this money will get less interest rates, so we have a bonus. If we underperform, you who borrow or lend this money to us will actually get a higher interest rate. People said this is crazy, this cannot work, you know, we're in the middle of a recession potentially and the financial markets are hyper nervous. You know what happened? In 24 hours, less than that, the bond was not only sold at one and a half billion dollars on the market, it was oversubscribed three to four times. What we're struggling with in today's world is that many developing countries, smaller developing countries, least developed countries, don't have access to capital and therefore are not able to invest in the energy transition. In fact, UNDP's report, and George Gray is somewhere, I think, amongst us, our chief economist here, has just produced a report that shows that 52 developing countries are one step away from being in debt distress or default, which is a catastrophic situation, a la Sri Lanka. They cannot afford to borrow anymore. They are, in many instances, using 20% of their government revenue to pay just the interest on their national debt. <laughs> I servicing their debt. And therefore not able to invest in education, in health, in access to clean electricity or even electricity in general. And the reason why I answer it by going through these examples is that I think that the world of the 21st century, of our era, is not defined anymore by north, south, simply in terms of who has technology or does not have technology but rather by the need to co-invest in one another. There are countries who have more technology or have capital, have accumulated wealth that they can bring to the equation of helping 1.4 billion African citizens or 2 billion by 2050 to either pivot into a clean energy economy infrastructure or to bring more people to the global energy matrix in the next 25 years than China has in the last 50 years. And these are, if you want, the let's say, variables with which developing countries now have to struggle. And much of what we are talking about when we talk about reform of the international financial architecture, Bretton Woods 2.0, is to finally come to grips with what is wrong with our international financial economy. You know, we are the richest generation in human history when it comes to money. Wealth, 400 trillion or more dollars accumulated at this moment and we can't find the hundred billion dollars that are supposed to help the developing world accelerate their investments, it just doesn't hold. So that's why the Secretary General last week introduced an SDG stimulus plan to the world where he said, we have to go to the financing issue. That's the great unequalizer or um, driver of inequality in the coming years. So Professor Karur is indicating that we have only one minute left, so I'll just take this as the final question. There are a lot of questions uh, to the uh, indicating the role of UNDP. Uh, while India has a vibrant startup ecosystem, we're still finding it, especially social in innovators and startups, are still finding it uh, difficult for accessing funding and scaling up the solution. So would you explain, uh, is UNDP planning to do something, is the, something in this area or increase the involvement in this area? Very briefly, there's a lot I could tell you, but much of what we have invested in, in UNDP and what we call sort of the future smart UNDP began, for example, by creating in each one of our country offices something we call the Accelerator Lab, where we looked for three unusual people from the country in which we work that we would attach to our country office team with a singular mandate of going out and understanding where innovations were emerging where government regulations or lack of targeted support or you know, distorting subsidies were getting in the way of these innovations to actually succeed, which has given us an extraordinary resource to connect to some of the most dynamic development actors, but also made us very interesting for government because suddenly we are able to together unearth the kinds of policy reforms that are needed to allow for a much more progressive view of these disruptors to become part of the mainstream, including sometimes recognizing the informal economy. 
which traditionally is sort of considered to be somewhere in the twilight zone of how economic development happens. And you know in India, there are hundreds of millions of people who live in the informal economy, mm -hmm. whose livelihoods depend on it. And during the pandemic, we suddenly realized that if you only look after those who are in the formal employment sector, you're going to miss the vast majority of the most vulnerable because you're not looking at them through the employment disruption mm -hmm. lens. So these are examples, just like we have introduced a sustainable finance hub in UNDP. We spent three years teaching ourselves how we can help countries to better access capital markets because that's where they will need to look for their capital to invest. And so the SDG bonds, that example from Uruguay that I gave, we are now working with many countries to essentially exercise their own sovereignty in determining for what they want to borrow money, but linking it essentially to an SDG logic, which is committing to investing in poverty reduction while investing in infrastructure, making financial inclusion more possible while expanding the digital yeah. public infrastructure. Yeah. Okay. So with this, I'll wind up. Thank you so much, Mr. Steiner. I wish I have covered almost all the topics. Due to paucity of time, I might have missed something. Kindly excuse me for that. And uh, we are certainly looking forward for more involving interactions and engagement. I wish we had more time. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you once again, Mr. Steiner. Yeah, I thought I had the unenviable task of taking over the responsibility of your team to remind you that you have another engagement. Uh, but um, finally, um, in closing, I'd like to thank everybody who's been involved in this, um, that uh, Mr. Akim Steiner could take time off to visit us and give this uh, presentation and answer questions that were raised. Um, the UNDP team for putting this together, or helping us putting this together. Thank you very much. And the institute team, top down, uh, who have helped us organize this. Thank you very much. And uh, just to remind you, as part of the International Women's Day celebration, we'll have another institute lecture on March 15th. Ah, uh, there is, yes, another photo that is uh, planned. This is there as per the schedule, I'm reminded now.